Hello class, welcome back to uh, Philosophy 1301. Today we're doing Chapter 4, which will be uh, Plato. Uh, the title of the of the chapter in your textbook is The Really Real, like the real in capital R. So that's what Plato's all about. Right? All right, so I told you that Plato was uh, Socrates. So we are talking about Socrates last, <clears throat> last lecture, excuse me. Um, and... Socrates, uh, Plato was Socrates' uh, student, perhaps his brightest student, well, undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly his brightest student. Um, Plato was there during the, the trial, death of Socrates. Um, he, the apology is taken, taken as pretty truth to what uh, Socrates said during the trial. Um, so Plato was was a uh, he actually uh, Plato right? So I told you that Socrates never wrote anything. So Plato, what we know about Socrates is by right, via Plato, Platon. Uh, and Plato, that's not his real name, by the way. Uh, Plato's like in his nickname. It's actually like his his wrestling name, like his stage name. So Plato is actually a wrestler, a real famous wrestler back in that day. Really good one too. Uh, Perhaps one of the best ones during this time period. So he's like a big time wrestler, but he's also a really smart man, like Plato. So Plato is like his wrestling name, like the Undertaker, or the Rock, right? Plato, which really means the broad one, right? the, the big one. Right? And many uh, scholars speculate right, uh, Plato could mean different, uh, very different connotations. It could allude to him being broad, like being broad shoulder and being a strong man. He's, could be his, his wrestling skills. Or he also had a big broad forehead. So it could be attributed to that as well. Or it could be attributed, right, Plato, which means broad, or the, the broad, right, like big um, in Greek, uh, to his uh, broad uh, and depth uh, philosophy that he gave us. Right? So pretty interesting thing about Plato, right? That's not his real name. His real name is Aristocles. <clears throat> but we use Plato. Right? We use we use his wrestling name. So Plato is the one that we know about because of Plato. He wrote down the Apology. Right? He was a witness to the trial of Socrates. He wrote that down. Right? Um, all of the early dialogues, or uh, yeah, the dialogues. So one thing about Plato that he wrote in his books, he wrote in dialogue form, dialectic, meaning one person, the main character, would be the protagonist would always be Socrates. And Socrates would always be talking to other people, and it'd be a dialogue form, kind of like a like a play, right? Socrates says this, Phaedo says this, uh, Socrates says this, uh, Euthyphro says this, or Crito says this, or whatever you're reading, whatever dialogue you're reading. But that's what we call uh, Plato's books. We call them dialogues, right? Because they're actually dialogues, right? They're just two people talking. And then behind this dialogue, behind this conversation between Socrates and his other interlocutor, there is a dialectic going on. That Socrates is building via the elencus. Okay, so the dialectic is, just means the the contemplation or the interplay of opposites, right? yin yang, right, day and night, right, uh, day, right, whatever. But it's dialectic, right? It's something that is uh, kind of like the backbone or like what kind of like what is produced, the effect the elencus gives. Besides reductio ad absurdum, right? We get there. The dialectic leads us towards this realization of reductio ad absurdum, in the hopes of getting towards closer to the truth, right, to the really real. And right? this is Plato. Right? So uh, what we know about Socrates is because of Plato. Right? So some some scholars argue that we really don't know the real Socrates. Right? We know Plato's Socrates, but not who Socrates really was. Right? So that's a really interesting uh, line of investigation going on right now in scholarship about uh, ancient Greek philosophers. Who was Socrates? Right? He was wise, that's, that's for sure. And he was a fool as well, right? So <clears throat> that's dialectic, right? The opposites. All right, so let's continue with Plato, right? So we break up his um, his life, kind of, right? His, his work, his scholarship, Plato's work. So he wrote a lot, and we have most of his books, right? A lot of them did, we did lose. So he was a prolific writer. 
And we break them up into three periods, the early Plato, the middle Plato, and then the late Plato. Uh, the early periods, uh, you have the, di uh, the dialogues of uh, Euthyphro, Crito, Meno, uh, who else? But Protagoras, is one of the sophists, uh, Gorgias, another sophist. So all those early dialogues are believed to be uh, not really Plato's own thought and own philosophy, but really just Socrates. He's kind of just repeating, just writing down what Socrates was saying. So the early dialogues is attributed more towards Socrates, Socratic philosophy, and not really Platonic ones. Okay. So, but it's all Plato, right? But so the, the early dialogues are attributed to more uh, being in line with or be more faithful to what Socrates said. And then the middle kind of split in between, but definitely the latter Plato is his own thought. It's Plato's own thought that actually sometimes very, or very often actually, contradicts what Socrates would, said, would, have, would have said. We see this kind of an evolution, a progression right, of Plato's writing from being faithful to his teacher, from kind of figuring out himself to totally being his own thinker. And this is a hallmark of a great philosopher, that you're growing, right? You don't stay stuck and stagnate, but you actually keep on growing, right? Asking yourself why. All right, so Plato, he was born in 427 BCE. He died in 437. So like I said, um, he comes from a really well-off family. He's an aristocrat. Uh, his family members are all in politics, very, very prominent politicians in, in Athens. In Athens right now, it's in the middle of the Peloponnesian War, right? the war between Sparta and the Daily League. <clears throat> and there's a lot of turmoil, but there's a lot of ideas flowing in and out as well. And Plato knew Socrates since he was a little kid. Right? Socrates was well, a known man by now. Uh, but it was into his teens that he really gets enthralled and enamored with Socratic thought. Right? So he kind of ditches uh, his family's hopes of him becoming a politician as well and chooses to uh, pursue a career in philosophy by pursuing Socrates, right? following Socrates around, becoming his best student eventually. Um, so in 399, uh, and that's the trial and the death of Socrates. Plato is 28 years old, right? pretty tender age. And his world is just completely turned upside down, completely just uh, torn apart. Right? So he, uh, he's so pissed at Athens. Right? The, the, the democracy in Athens put the wisest, the most just um, person that the world has ever seen. And that's his own words, pretty much, Plato says. Uh, that he takes off, saying, fuck you, Athens, and he takes off. He just kind of travels for a while, just itinerant. It becomes a wanderer. Um, scholars argue that he, he might have gone to Egypt for a while, you know, to, to Samos, he met uh, Pythagoras, uh, met his other really important other great thinkers and got influenced by them. Right? Uh, maybe he had, um, while well, he was in Egypt, got influenced by uh, Eastern philosophy, which we'll talk in Chapter 6. Right, uh, Buddhism or Hinduism. I mean, Hinduism must be in being exposed to those kind of Vedic traditions that were really big in India and in the Hindus Valley during the same time period. <clears throat> so, so he travels a lot. Right? So he travels for like about, I say, three about ten years or so. Yeah, he travels about ten, eleven years for a decade at least. So he goes to all these places. He goes to Italy. Right, he goes to uh, he goes to Syracuse, um, Sicily, right? These are ancient Greek colonies. Right? Remember, Alcibiades tried to invade Sicily and try to take over, and he failed terribly. So he goes out there. Um, he tries to um, implement uh, his own views of government in Syracuse, right? There's a tyrant, uh, the, the leader of Syracuse, the city there off the Sicilian coast. Um, uh, Dionysius is the name of, name of the tyrant. And here, tyrant back then doesn't mean the tyrant nowadays. Now, when we would see the word tyrant, we think about like a dictator, right? Mussolini, or Stalin, or Hitler, 
right? A tyrant, right? Kim Jong Il or something like that. The tyrant back then was really just been a tyrannus, which means strong man, right? So just a big strong man, right? The leader, right? Someone who is strong and thus could overtake other people and thus becomes the leader, the you know, uh, the governor of that area. Right? <clears throat> so that's what a tyrant means. A strong man. <clears throat> all right. Um, so right. So anyways, right, he travels a lot. It's exposed to all kinds of different philosophies, and it really, really takes it in all in. And he comes back in 387. Um, oh, so he meets Pythagoras and Herac Heraclitus. We met these people before, right? He's the Socratics, right? So he meets Pythagoras. He becomes a Pythagorean, and he meets Heraclitus, right? And he gets really, really influenced by these two uh, pre-Socratics uh, thinkers. 387 BCE returns back to Athens, where he founds. Um, Arguably the first world's university, the world's first university, which we call the Academy. So Plato's Academy. Right? So it's pretty, it's pretty much just a think tank. It's just a center where you go and you think about astronomy, right? Philosophy, politics, right? You have classes, right? Both men and women are welcome in there. Right? So it's a it's a great place. It's, it's a place of higher learning. Like community college, right? Or like UTEP or something like that. Okay, so um, he founds that, he's the director, and in, in that academy, he lasts a long time, well after his death. It lasts about a thousand years, actually, this university that Plato founds in Athens, the academy. Uh, yeah. The academy, um, for a hundred years, something like a thousand, for a hundred years, for hundreds of years, almost a thousand years, for hundreds of years for sure. So from 387 all the way to, what is it, 523? 529, when Justinian the first, the Justinian the Great, the emperor, the first Holy Roman emperor, right, the one who converts to Christianity, closes it down. So yeah, almost uh, about 800 years it lasts, right? So I'm really bad at math, so you guys do the math there. From 387, 387 BCE, all the way to 529 AD, or uh, CE, Common Era. Justinian. Quick fact about Justinian, the great, um, he's the one you pray to, the, Jesus Christ. He becomes emperor of Rome. Rome is pretty much controls the whole known world at this time period, in the 500s. Uh, and he realizes, right, he uses Christianity, converts it as a state religion, Justinian. Um, and he goes around his Roman dominion, and he goes to like North Africa, right, Egypt, right, Algeria. Then he goes up to like London, right? And he realizes that Jesus, right, the image of Jesus in these different Roman colonies are different skin color, different images of Christ. And he, he kind of finds that to be troubling, right? Because he's kind of using Christianity as a, a tool, as an instrument for state control, Justinian. That's why he makes it a state religion, right? To force people to be, make it easier to control them, Roman citizens. It's a huge Roman empire, right? So to make it easier to, to, to for this control, he wants to uniformize, right? Make it homogenize the image of Christ, the savior. Uh, so whereas in Africa, Christ understandably is gonna be darker skin than in London, right? In England. So he um, he's figuring out like, how do, how do I make it uniform? How do I make it all the same, right? And he's thinking about it in the royal court in Rome. Right? What, what do I do, right? What do we do? And these are with his uh, royal artists, his painters, his sculptures, and they're fucking pondering like, who do we, which one do we use? And he's like, aha, because of an idea. You know what, guys? Fuck it. Use me. Use my image. Right, my selfie. And that's Jesus Christ, like the the image that we have, like on the walls that your grandma prays to and stuff. Right? So when we pray to Jesus Christ, right, when the crucifixion or any like you know, uh, calendar, right, Mexican uh, stores and panaderias, bakeries. They always give you like calendars and they always have like Jesus Christ or something like that. And that dude, right, the white one, right, never wondered why Jesus Christ is white, even though he lived in the Middle East, right, in Palestine, where people are like brown, right, or darker. It's because of that, it's Justinian, right? You guys didn't know this story there, now you know. <clears throat> so, anyways, Justinian is the one that closes the academy, Plato's the academy. So, it lasts a long time. It's really, really put in place, right? It gives us like the first model of what a university is supposed to be. 
Um, all right. So um, so let's move on. Um, so he writes about 25 of these dialogues, Plato, the early ones, uh, the middle ones, and then the later ones. The early, like I said, it's all about Socrates' thought, his, his teacher's uh, philosophy. His middle um, dialogues are the, the Phaedo, the Symposium, the Republic, and the Titetus. And this you can see Plato here beginning to develop his own thought, especially with the Phaedos and the Titetus. That's where we get our standard notion of what knowledge is for about 2,000 years. And I'll go over that right now. Then his later, right, his, his last dialogues, are the most famous ones at least, uh, Parmenides, Sophist, Critias, and the Laws. And this for sure is just Plato, his own philosophy now, well developed. Right? So this pretty nice progression that we see with Plato here. Right? <clears throat> All right, so knowledge and reality. So Socrates and Plato both believe, contrary to what the Sophists and the pre oh no, not the pre-Socratics, the Sophists believed, um, and what we call the skeptics believes. Right? So Socrates and Plato believe that there was an access that we could access, right, or we could discover. That'd be a better word to use. Discover the really real. There's something out there. There, there is knowledge out there that is discoverable that we could discover and learn. The Sophists, on the other hand, are skeptic, and they're relativist, which means that knowledge is not really out there somewhere, right, for everybody to reach and grab, but knowledge is relative to you and your own needs and your own context surrounding you. So what might work for me might not work for you, right? and that's fine, it's just the Sophists. But Plato and Socrates are like, no, 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 like that's not the way it is. You know, there's there's something real. There is a real reality there for us to discover. Right? We just gotta be, we gotta use and sharpen our rationality skills to be able to discover those realities or that reality, that really real out there. This is what we call metaphysics. Right? We have the physical, and then we have the metaphysics. Right? The real, the physical, and then the meta, the really real, right? What's the structures that make up this reality in front of me, right? What is the structure of light, and what is it that gives light its essence to be light, right? Or being, right? This is the question of metaphysics. And this is what Plato and Socrates are grappling. It's like, yeah, there is reality here, but there's still something beyond that that we need to discover. Uh, and the skeptics, on the other hand, Sophists were like, no, you guys are dumb. You know, first of all, there is no. I mean, we're human beings. We're animals, essentially. And those were limited. Right? Yes, we have rationality, but our rationality is still limited. So we cannot get go beyond just our senses. And for me, I take off my glasses and I can't see for shit. Right? Put them on and see better. Right? I'm still messed up with my eyes right now, but I can see better with my asses, um, my glasses. Uh, so my senses right, could mistake me. Right? My senses could fool me. So my, my, what I think I'm seeing might not be real at all. Right? And this is what the skeptics kind of hone in on and, and kind of develop to a further extent to be like, you know what, we're just a skeptic. You know, we're skeptical that we could actually have access to this reality that Plato Socrates pertain towards. Right? So the skeptic is just a view that we lack knowledge in some fundamental way. Whereas Plato, right, who's a rationalist, would say like, no, we are rational, we are rational animals and with this rationality, we could access that knowledge. We could access the fundamental reality of our existence. And the skeptics are like, no, we're just we're not capable of doing that. Right? So two kind of approaches to knowledge this is now epistemology, okay? So philosophy is always a mixture between these subfields of metaphysics, logic, epistemology, aesthetics, right? And Plato does that really, really well, right? He's one of those very, what we call systemic philosophers that they systematically um, analyze an issue with all these different kind of perspectives, right? All right. Um, all right, well, in any case, the skeptics believe that knowledge is impossible, right? Or that at least we will never be able to reach what real true knowledge is. 
right? That all that we could do, the best we could do is just really that we have beliefs. Right? We have beliefs, but no real, true, objective, universal knowledge. As Plato and Socrates claim we could reach. <clears throat> so knowledge, right? And the implications of the skeptic view, though, is that if it's on knowledge and we cannot access knowledge like this, then philosophy is empty. Philosophy is useless then. So, and Plato and Socrates are going to defend that. Like, no, no, no. Philosophy is super important because there is knowledge to know there. Right? We can know stuff out there. All right, so believing and knowing. This will be a good way to, to be a good time to distinguish, distinguish between what is a belief and what is knowledge, right? And Plato gives us this, right? It's in the Tetatus, um, a justified true belief. That's the formula that Plato gives us that uh, accounts right, or that qualifies as knowledge, right? It's not just belief, it's beyond just a mere belief. It's a justified true belief. So what does this mean? All right, so first of all, you must have some kind of belief. Believe it's hot outside. Okay, I believe that. Right? You gotta believe it. Right? Second of all, it must be true. Right? So I do, I went outside all day, it was fucking hot, actually, not just hot, super hot, right? It was 180 degrees, holy hell. Right, so I might believe it, and then it's true now. Okay. We're not done yet, says Plato. Right? We, need this, we need this other thing, justification. We need to be justified on believing that this is true. So how do I know it's true, this belief that it's hot? Uh, well, I saw the news, the meteorologist said it's 108. I went outside to go to the store real quick, and I was sweating a lot right away. So as I go outside, I was like, holy crap, it's hot. My eyes were burning right? because the sun was so bright, too. Um, so justified, right? I have my justifications, i.e., my premises. Right? I have these premises. I, I experienced it. I was outside. I was sweating. <clears throat> I saw the meteorologist, where right? he told me it's 108 degrees. Right? I have all these justifications that now justify my belief that it happens to be true. Right? Justify true belief. And basically, just uh, another different way of saying how to make an argument, right? You have either your premises, your justifications, and then your conclusion, your belief. Right? And if it's true, right? Your premises are true. Conclusions must be true. A justified true belief. This is what differentiates between knowledge and knowing. I mean, knowledge and belief. I'm sorry. Right? Mere belief is just a belief. I believe. I'm the smartest man alive, right? I can believe that all I want. Is it justified or is it true? Not really, not at all, actually, right? I'm not the smartest man alive ever, right? and nor do I wish to be either way. Um, but these are the steps, right? These are the qualifications, right? right? This is a, a, a retort, right? This is a, a challenge against the skeptic view. Like, you know what? No, it's not just beliefs that we have. It's we have beyond beliefs, right? If we have justifications and that we know it's true, then that belief becomes knowledge. Okay? So justified true belief equals knowledge. And that's the formula that Plato gives us. Okay. All right. So this this justification, right, and this um this this, this truthfulness, right? all has to deal with how we use our rationality, our faculties for reason. Right? Uh, let me give you what Plato says in uh, his dialogue, Man, which is a really good one about epistemology. Uh, True opinions are a fine thing and do all sorts of good so long as they stay in their place. But they will not stay long. They run away from a man's mind. So they are not worth much until you tether them by working out the reason. Once they are tied down, they become knowledge. So I could uh, I could spend the whole day inside, right, in my air conditioner, uh, with my my blinds closed, not knowing that it's hot outside, right. I really don't have a TV, right. So I, when I saw the meteorologist, it was my weather app, my phone. But say I don't have a phone, right, but I have an AC and I have my my windows are are closed up, 
So I don't know if it's hot or it's like, or it's cold. Right? Or maybe I just came out of a coma. Right? And I'm like, what, what year is it? Or what day is it? Right? Is it winter? Is it, is it springtime? Is it fall? Or is it summer? And then I just have an opinion. You know what? It's summer. It must be hot outside. And it just happens to be true. Right? I don't know it. I really don't know. Right? I just woke up out of a coma. That's not knowledge, says Plato. Right? That's the true opinion. Right? And that's fine. Those, that's good. Right? That, those are good, right? as he says. But they're not going to be good for long. Right? They're not going to stay there long. Right? Those things change. Right? So maybe or Let me give you another example. There's, there's like a little... Uh, what is it called? Like a little reservoir. Right? Uh, like a little dam. Like a, a storm reservoir. So when it rains, a lot of the water raise, rises up there. Um, and sometimes it's a couple of duckies go in there. It's pretty cool, pretty cute. And I like to go walk around there. It's like a little park and then there's a little reservoir. Um, it's a really nice way to, to walk, a right? really nice place to walk. Um, and right now, it hasn't rained in a long time, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm just having an opinion, right? pretty much just guessing, right? that there's no ducks there because it hasn't rained, right? And I'm just, it's an opinion, right, it is right now. Uh, that right now, it might be true, right? I won't know until I have a justification that I know it's true. And how can I justify this opinion to be true? I mean, namely, just to go out there, walk to that reservoir, to that park, and see if there's ducks there or not, if there's water or not. Then that opinion that I have here at home, that there's no ducks, becomes knowledge because it's justified true belief. Right. So start off with the belief. There's ducks in that reservoir, or there's no ducks, whatever, right? And then I had to go and get a justification, right? Go out there and actually justify it. Uh, and how do we do that, right? It's a mixture between not just rationality. I mean, that is the main inner workings of knowledge, but also we need our senses, right? The the body and the mind, right? It's kind of like this, this this dualism here. But for Plato, undoubtedly. The mind is the most powerful thing. Well, I'll explain that right now in a little bit. Why? <clears throat> so it's justified true belief. I guess I, I, let's go into his, his theory of the form now. So I think that's a good way to explain a lot of his thinking, right? the theory of the forms. It, it's a really beautiful little theory that he has. But it, has it captures his metaphysics and his, his, his epistemology. It's a really cool little theory. Right? Um, I myself don't prescribe to it, but I respect it and I appreciate it. Right? But I don't, I don't believe it's true, but I, I enjoy teaching it. And working with it too. Um, so, because our sense experience doesn't give us our true knowledge, right? We gotta use our rationality, right? Right. So, sense experience, right? My senses alone is not gonna give me that justified true belief. Right? There's something more out there, says Plato, right? Which he calls, which he calls the forms. Right? That's the real knowledge. That's the really real. Right. So. <clears throat> So the real, right, this, 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 this certainty, right, is, is, is immutable, right, it's, it's unchanging, it has to be universal and objective, right, uh, it has to be about ob an object out there, right, but here in real life, like in everyday life right now, right, in the physical world right now of me, there's a table, there's a book, a textbook, right, there's my cup with chai tea, um, so my other cup with water, Right. And behind, I have another cup of vodka. Anyways, all these things, right? I have a cup, but this this has a couple of chips here and there. And the bottom is like pretty used up, pretty scratched up in the bottom, right? It's far from perfect. Right? Yet I I use it around, right? It's helpful. It's good for me. This is the way opinions are, right? 
think about it, right? I just talked, to, I just gave you this, this quote about him, right? That mere opinions or true opinions are good, but it's not until we tether them down, tie them down with reason, that they become immutable. The same thing with the form here, right? So I have, I have this particular cup here, right? But it's imperfect, right? It changes. Right now it's kind of cool because it had some ice in it. Here's the ice. Right? <clears throat> but it's melting, right? In a couple of minutes, it's going to melt completely and it's going to be uh, look warm. And if I leave it out, it's going to be hot, right? So it changes, right? It's not immutable. It's not eternal, right? It's always changing. It's always in transit. It's always in flux here, right? And that's the way our, our superficial reality is, right? Everything's changing. Everything's imperfect. I'm imperfect. Um, but this imperfections here, this particular, this particular human being, me, right, or you, right, as individuals, are projections, right, of a perfect object out there that represents you. So think about this, right? So there's two worlds, right, or two, like, dimensions for Plato. The world of the now, right now, the physical appearance, and then the really real, the world of the forms. So right now I have a cup. Right now I mentioned all the imperfections it has. It has a couple of chips on the top. It has a lot of scratches on the bottom. And right? it's kind of losing its color and stuff. Um, but in the world of the forms, there's the same cup, but it's perfect. And it's eternal. And it's never changing. Right? And it's always going to be there. But what I have now here in my hand, though, is like a projection. It's just a particular model, right, prototype, right, of that concept. Okay, that's how reality is broken up, right? Or, or reality, yeah, that's how reality is broken up for, for Plato. Right? So you have these concepts that are ever eternal, right? The really real, and then you have the particular physical manifestations of them. <clears throat> it's only through the power of reason that we can reach, that we can open up the gate, right? This epistemological gate from the physical realm to the realm of the forms of these eternal truths of the really real. So for Plato, reality consists of two worlds, right? Two dimensions. The fleeting, ever-changing world of the physical realm, which is access to sense experience, right, sensory qualities, and then the eternal, non-physical, changeless right? world of genuine knowledge. Right? That and this is only access through reason. Okay, so I told you, right, he, he has the body and the mind. Right. So we're always right, right now is just the body, right? The sense experiences. And then when we think about things, when we reflect and use a reason, then we're opening, we're going beyond just the physical realm and into the realm of the forms. Right? The changeless eternal, genuine knowledge. And this is how the way that he uh, challenges the sophists and the skeptics. It's like, yeah, you guys are just in this first world here, the world of, of, of appearances, the world of the physical world. You guys are not going beyond that. And that's philosophy, right? And that's where relativism and um, skepticism is wrong, according to Plato. So the forms, right? I'm talking about the world of the forms. What are these things? Right? What the fuck are the forms? And this is with a capital F, the forms, right? Just like the real, right? So the forms uh, compose what is the real, with capital R. So there's, uh, so the forms, right? In one sense of the term, the forms, which he also calls ideas, capital I, ideas, are these perfect conceptual models, right? These concepts, these models of this cup, of the flag behind me, right? Or the bookcase behind me or whatever, or the poster of Josh Callis doing a blunt slide on the Love Park in Philadelphia, right? Somewhere there's like the physical one, right? This, this poster I've had for years, and then somewhere out there beyond the physical realm, in the realm of the forms, there's that perfect poster. And I'm not the only one that has this poster, right? I got this from a magazine, Trasher magazine. So I'm sure hundreds of kids back in my days had this poster as well. 
I just kept it. I saved it because I love it. <clears throat> right? So mine is not the only one, but there was a con the concept, right? The artist came up with the concept, right, of this poster. And then it became printed out, and all these copies were made. Kind of like that here, right? So you have this perfect concept, this perfect model, right? The form of whatever, a horse, right? Whatever object, like a guitar. I'm a guitar right there, right? Perfect guitar. And then in the world, there's all these different kind of guitars, right? From shitty Esquire ones to badass Gibsons, right? <clears throat> you guys kind of see this, the epistemology here, the, 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 the world of the forms, the theory of the forms? So there's two worlds, right? Our physical, everyday experience that we have access through our senses, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, right, touching. And then the world of the forms, the world of real knowledge, of the really real, that is only accessed through our knowledge, through, through rationality, through reason. Okay. So two worlds, right? All right. So they're conceptual models, right? Um, and according to Plato, these 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 models, these conceptual models, are actually more real than what we think is real right now. Right. So Heraclitus, right? These pre-Socratics that he was influenced on. This is the obvious influence from them. Remember this distinction between reality and appearance? Here, Plato is taking it to a whole other level. But it's the same basic distinction, right, between reality and appearance, right? Think about the paradoxes of Sino, right? Sino's paradoxes. If movement is real, right, it was just an appearance of it. Here, Plato is taking it to a more deeper, deeper level, right, encompassing everything in life. So you have the appearance, right, of physical reality. And that's helpful, but then beyond that, there's the really real, right, the reality out there. And this distinction here is going to haunt us for the rest of the semester here, right? Later on, uh, you're going to have uh, Kant, right? Immanuel Kant, in modern philosophy, make the same distinction, right? The world of the phenomena, right? The, right now, everyday phenomenon, and then the world of the noumen, noumena, right? That, out there world that we just don't, don't have access to, he says. But still, the distinction is here made with Plato in 400 BCE or 500 something BCE. All right, so the forms of the universe, right, is perfect conceptual models that project, right, the particular models that we deal with in our everyday life. So the particulars reside in the temporal imperfect right world of the material stuff whereas the universals right these forms are found in the eternal world of the really real the really real right? and the reason why we could um, access both these realms is because we are part of these forms we partake says plato in these forms so think about me, right? I'm a, I'm a male, uh, and I'm, a, I guess, what? Well, how can you say? Brown. <laughs> Let's use that, right? I'm pretty brown. So I'm male, human. I'm human, I'm male, and I'm brown, right? I have those three, like, distinctions. So out there in the world, there's a perfect concept or a model of brown, or the concept of brown, the concept of male and the concept of human, right? But me, I'm just a, I'm just like an imperfect kind of mixture of those perfect, right? For a projection, right? A manifestation of those concepts mixed together. Let's talk about a horse, right? Uh, a brown horse, right? Um, a brown horse. When you go see a brown horse, you ride a horse, right? It's brown, right? That horse partakes in the form of brown. And the concept of brown and the concept of a horse. But in reality, there's a brown horse galloping. I like our special effects, so. Anyways, you guys kind of get this? Or I'm thinking about a, a blue cup. This blue cup partakes in the forms of blue, the concept of blue, and the concept, the model of cup. But here in the reality, I mean, in, in, the, in the particular world of, of material, physical forms, or physical realm, Right, it's this cup here. Right. 
which is imperfect, which is going to break eventually, right? But uh, during the forums, the concepts, the models, those don't break, don't change, they're there forever. And here, right, so there's like a, there's a threshold, right? There's a physical census, and then there's like a gate, and then there's the world of forms. How you open up the gate? Reason, right? So use your senses first to understand your physical reality, your material reality, and then you use reason to open up the really real. That's Plato's epistemology, the theory of the forms. And how do they justify that these forms are eternal, that we know that, that they're uh, changeless, and that they actually exist? Right? Plato has this idea of innate knowledge. He believes that we are born with knowledge that is innate, that we have to learn it. So I guess here would be a good time to make this to, to teach you the, the distinction to distinguish between empirical knowledge, right, and rational knowledge, right? rationalism, empiricism, and rationalism. Right? Empiricism is the view that we gain knowledge via our senses, via our experience, in our senses. Rationalism is a view that we gain knowledge just via our reason. Thinking. Um, so these, these forums, right? It takes a, it's, it's like it's a it's a rationalist approach to knowledge, right? So in the first part, the first physical realm is empiricist, where we sense experience reality or what we think is reality, and then once we open up the gate to the really real with reason, with rationality, then we get the whole picture. Um, and how do we know there's forms out there? Plato says that we know them already, as soon as born. It's this innate knowledge. Right? Um, they're, really, they're inscribed in our mind, right? Uh, because of our previous existence. So he believes in metempsychosis, which is reincarnation, right, Plato. So accessing these forms is really just a matter of recalling what you already know, what's already in there, what's an in inside everybody's minds already inscribed there. It's called innate knowledge, right? Um, and the way he kind of like describes this this innate knowledge is by this dialogue in Menno, right? This little story in Menno, the dialogue Menno that Peter wrote. I think it's one of his later dialogues. Um, and is that this dialogue, there's like this this story of this geometrist, right? This guy that does geometry, this mathematician. And he's stuck in a problem, a really hard geometry problem. He can't figure it out. He's there for weeks. And he's trying to figure it out and just can't. And, and there's this little slave boy. And so Mano is a geometrist guy, the mathematician. And Mano is trying to, he has, he's stuck with this problem. And he has a little slave boy. He's about seven years old. He's a slave. Right? So slavery is normal back then, right? I was always been around. Um, and he's illiterate, he's a slave. He doesn't know how to read or how, doesn't know how to write, doesn't know how to count, right? Because he's not exposed, he's just a servant. But he walks in to Menno's study room where the problem is in the in the in the word in the in the ball in the wall on the board. And this little slave boy fucking figures this out, figures out the problem. Right? And Socrates is there with him, right? With Menno, and they see this. He's like, wow, how the fuck did he do this? And Socrates, supposedly in the story. Uh, says like no yeah like he this this is a proof right this is a justification of why we have innate knowledge right the reason why this little slave boy knew this problem is because in his past life the slave boy must have been a really smart guy right? in his present life now he's a slave but the slave boy was able to use his little rationality and to recall what he knew back then in his previous life to to solve the problem for Mendel. So he nearly had to recollect the knowledge he already had. This is Plato. Right? This is what Plato thinks. Right? So the truth, this is what Plato says when he writes. And if the truth of all things always existed in the soul, then the soul is immortal. So this story, man, uh, not, also, uh, not only helps us understand the theory of the forms, right, what the forms are, but also is uh, helps us understand uh, Plato's theory of souls and the immortality of souls. Right? So 
talk about is Plato's idea of the soul. What should we talk about? No, let's, let's keep that for later. I'm, I'm going to keep that for later. I'm sorry. Let's, let's, let's finish off his rationality. Let's finish off his epistemology and his metaphysics. Right, so we have two worlds, the world of the physical, the world of the forms. Right? One, one, the physical world, is accessed through uh, our senses. The world of the forms, the really real, is accessed through rationality. Right? So we have this split between empiricism and rationalism. Right? And many people, uh, scholars, um, credit or give, the, give Plato this title as the father of rationalism. Because he believes that rationalism is is much uh, important, or it's better, basically, than empiricism. And why? Let me show you why. So let's go into the allegory of the cave now. In the allegory of the cave, you'll find it in his um, in his middle uh, dialogue, The Republic, Plato's The Republic. Strongly recommend you all to read this book. Um, we have a little excerpt here in your textbook, but uh, I, honestly, um, every person that reads this book, their life changes forever. It's one of those books. It's, it's super influential, perhaps like the second most influential book besides the Bible. And as a matter of fact, the Bible steals a lot of ideas from this book. So Plato's The Republic. And particularly this, this translation is really good. I like this translation more than the other ones. but. Check this out, man. It's super cheap out there. You can find it for free online because right? it was written about 2,000 years ago. Take your time to read it. It's not that thick. It's not that long. Well, it's kind of long, but it's, it's really easy to read. It's all in dialogue form. And right? I can play like two dialogues between people. Socrates is the main character. And it talks about justice, about love, about suicide, about war, about politics, about everything. It's a fantastic little book. Truly, truly a game changer. Recommend y'all to access this book and change your lives for the better. All right. Anyways, the allegory of the case is from the beginning of the book seven. So each each chapter is called the book, right? So instead of instead of chapters, Plato uses books. But it's, it's the same kind of concept. So in chapter seven, book seven of the Republic, we find this allegory of the cave. It's fucking beautiful. It's allegory of the cave. So the allegory of the cave goes like this. So imagine these people are locked up in a cave, and they're chained up. Uh, they're they're enchained, right? They're they're chained up. They're prisoners. And these prisoners are chained up in the matter they they can only see one side to one towards a wall. Right. So there's a wall, right? And they're enchained. They cannot look. They can, they can only look sideways. And no, they can only look forward. They cannot look sideways or backwards. And there's about eight of them or so, or, or, or 12, right? And they're all in the same position, looking towards this wall. Behind them, and at an elevation, right, there's like a little passageway behind them. Um, and then behind this little passageway, this little bridge, is a, uh, there's a, oh, in front of it, there's a fire. Right? Well, behind it, there's a fire. There's a fire, a passageway, like a bridge. Okay, I cannot... Let me see if I could, uh, I'm going to be really bad at drawing this. So there's the prisoners locked in, facing forwards towards a wall. Behind them, there's a bridge uh, at, at an elevation. Behind that bridge is a fire burning. Right? And then there's a bridge, there's all these people um, walking back and forth, talking to each other, blah, 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 carrying different items, a book. Another one carries a, a statue. Another one carries a canister with water, and splashes and stuff. So all these people walking behind these prisoners, right, carrying different items, and they're talking to each other, and there's a fire, right? And this fire emits a shadow on the wall that these prisoners, and that's all they could see, are only the shadows that these people are emitting, right? And you could hear it, right? But they can't look back, so they don't, they don't know there's a fire back there. They don't know there's a bridge or right, a walkway, and they don't know there's people with objects walking around. All they see is shadows, right? And with voices. So they think that's, that's what reality is. They've been there since birth. That's all they know since birth. So all those, those shadows for them, that's what real is, right? That's the reality. That's what they know. 
right? These shadows. So they have competitions <laughs> to figure out who could best uh, guess what's really going on in those shadows, right? <laughs> and that's what, how they uh, pass time, right? These competitions. <laughs> and lo and behold, one day, one of those prisoners, bam, his fucking chain breaks. And he's like, holy shit. And he slowly turns around. And he's like, holy crap. It's a fucking fire back there. And there's all these people walking in front of the fire, making the, making these, casting the shadow on the walls. He's mind blown. He's like, holy shit. All, everything I thought was real is not real. Holy crap. Let me investigate more. So he, he breaks out from the chain, turns his back, look, looks at the reality, what's going on. He's like, holy shit, I'm, I'm in the cave. And he sees like an opening, right? even more light, brighter than the fire. Like, what the fuck? That, there's even more real? Like, there's, this is not even the real, real, real? What the fuck's going on here? So he climbs up, or he comes, like, goes up the bridge, and right? says what's up to the people with the objects. What's up, guys? Nice to meet you. He looks at the fire. He's like, holy shit. At first, he's like, oh, man, that fire inside. It's like, he gets used to it, and, and then he sees that big, bright light outside, right? An opening in the cave. He's like, well, let me go out there. So he, he goes, he climbs out of the cave. And he steps out of the cave, and he's blinded by the light. Right? Sticks. Right? This, is a, this is a rock band that has a, a song like that. Blinded by the light. So that happens to him, right? It takes him a while. He's burning. It's burning. His eyes are burning. It burns. It hurts. It hurts to see reality. That's what Plato's saying here. Right? So he's, he's burning. He's, it's hurting. And it takes him a good while to get used to it. Right? This happens to us all the time. You're in a dark room. Turn on the light. And your eyes kind of hurt for a while, and then you get used to it, right? And then he sees a tree. Holy shit, this is fucking beautiful. He sees a fucking squirrel in the tree. Holy crap, what the fuck is this? Right, and he sees a river right next to the tree and water flowing. And he sees grass, and he sees the sun, and it burns more. And, he's, and he sees reality for the first time ever. And he's like, holy fucking shit. He's mind blown. And he's like, wow, all my life I was living in a cave, looking at shadows, believing they were real. He's like, dude, I gotta go back and tell my homies. I gotta go back to the to the cave and tell them, yo, guys, we're living a lie. We're living in a world of shadows. We're living in this world of of that's not reality. There's more to this world that you see. There's there's a big world out of here, man. So he, he goes, he goes back to the cave, and he's oh man, he's, he's super dark. He can't see, right? And he's like, he can't see. Right? Super dark. He's so used to the light now. And he goes down there where the people are having their competitions, right? The prisoners trying to figure out what what is really happening in the shadows, right? What is really real in the shadows? And he's there, he's stumbling, he's trying to get used to the darkness. And his, and his friends are laughing at him. He's like, "Look at this fool! Look at this fool! Look at like an idiot here, right? Stumbling." And he's talking about this reality out there, right? He's saying like, "Oh, this is not real. These shadows are not real, guys. Like, there's something more out there." And they're just laughing at. Him. What the fuck are you talking about, dude? Like this is the, all we know, right? This is the reality. And he gets in, and they get annoyed, these prisoners, and they end up killing this guy. That figure out they're religious shadows. And that's the allegory of the cave, and that's a fucking powerful story about how we live here in our reality. Or right, we get we live in our own little caves that we get so comfortable that we don't want to go and explore the really real because it fucking hurts, right? When you get when you confront to the truth, right? The truth hurts. Right? It burns. Right? And that's what Plato is telling us. Don't be afraid. Break away. Break those chains. Right? You're living in the world of shadows. Right? Go and, and think for yourself. And go beyond just what you see every day. And always question and go beyond that. Go to the light. Right? Go to the truth. Break away from those chains. And turn. And look at better perspectives around you. Don't get stuck in this real re little reality, little cave that makes us comfortable. A world, a bigger world is there waiting for you to be discovered. Right? And this is, I think this this allegory of the cave is super powerful. I love it. I, I'm really, really, this is the only thing of Plato that I really fucking enjoy is this allegory of the cave. Because it could be, uh, it's a perfect allegory, not just for like epistemology, right? It's, it's theory of the forms that we live in this physical world that's kind of like, it's a shadowy world. It's not really real until we get out there by using reason to get to the really real. And not only did it explain explains that, but it also could be applied to our um, politics. Right now, it's going to be election uh, election year. 
really important election year, 2020, right? You're going to be fed, right? These TV ads by Joe Biden and by Donald Trump, a bunch of bullshit on both sides, really, right? Shadows, right? Go beyond that, right? Go beyond that reality, right? Or it could be, um, you know, applied to, um, I don't know, uh, the media, right? People that all, all they see, all they get the news from is like from Fox News and CNN and don't actually read books and research and libraries and stuff are going to have, are living in the shadow worlds that are being fed these images. But if that's, that's, not, it's, if that's your reality, what you see on TV, same thing as those people are living in the shadows. Right? Go beyond that. Break away from those chains and read a book. Right? And again, read this fucking book here. Right? And learn. Right? And break away from being a sheep, basically. Right? And this is what Plato gives us, right? This, this, this courage, right? This realization that we might be living in this world of shadows. And we should take the courage to step away from that and break those chains and reach a better understanding of our reality, of reality, the really real. All right. Fuck yeah, I get super excited about the allegory in the cave. This shit's fucking cool. All right, let's talk about Plato's concept of the soul. As for him, the soul is immortal. He believes in this thing called metempsychosis which is just a fancy Greek word for uh, reincarnation. Right? So like the, the little slave boy, right? Before he before his present state as a slave, he must have been a really smart mathematician because he was able to figure out that ge geometry problem for me. <clears throat> All right, so, so let's talk about the soul. So the Greeks before Plato or before the 500 BCE era, 500, the fifth century BCE, um, it was a really simple concept of the soul for the Greeks. It was really just an indicator of life or not. If you were alive, you had a soul. If you were dead, you, died, you had no soul. Simple as that. Soul, alive, no soul, dead. Pass. It's like I won't. And then later on, people started, you know, you got, you got the pre-Socratics, right? Kind of developing more ideas, right? And this concept of the soul became more and more complex. So by the time that Plato was around, right? The soul was now thought to be not just an indication of life or death, but more than that, right? The soul was assumed to be the seat of emotions and desires, right? The center of all practical thinking, right? Um, or the processor of moral values, right? It was, an it was an important center for our everyday reality, the soul. That's where we get our morality. What's right and wrong is from the soul, right? Or uh, our thinking, practical thinking comes from the soul. So the soul became a really important uh, seat for living. Right? Socrates and Plato, um, right, they declare, they, they think that the intellect is the highest part of a human, right, of the human soul, the intellect. So they kind of incorporate all these different views of the soul into one big system. Right? So hence, for Plato, the soul has three parts. It's a tripartite soul. Right? And it's the appetitives. Uh, the spirited, and then the rational part, right? The appetite, the appetitive part, is just basic survival, right? Uh, food, right? Uh, fornication, right? Um, bodily, you know, basic human, animal, really, right? This is what we share with every other animal, right? The appetitive, right? just a, our, our basic instinct for survival, right? We need food, we need shelter, we need to procreate, um, and we need to poop, basically, right? Basic animal functions, right? This is the appetitive part, just the, the real simple part of of a human, right? The avaricious part, he says, right? The greedy part of the human, the appetite, right? Which uh, which kind of drives our desires for our bodily functions. Okay, so food, drink, sex, sleep and other pleasurable things. The second part of the soul is a spirit part. So it is what he calls the competitive part of the soul. So this is what, uh, when we have a sense of self and a sense of ambition, right? So when, we when we're motivated to maximize our, uh, our honor, right? 
or self-esteem or recognition, right? Success, right? Uh, winning, right? Competitiveness, right? That's the second part of the soul. The third part of the soul is the reason, right? And this is the philosophical and the intellectual part of the soul. And this is the soul that pursues truth. Uh, both practical and theoretical truth and regulates the other two parts. So for Plato, for Plato, a good soul, right, a good person is uh, driven by the intellectual part of the soul right, that then harmo har harmonizes the other parts. Right? So the intellect, right, the, the, the reason part so it has to be in the driver's seat and then controlling the other parts. Um, that's what is, for him, a good soul for Pedro. So this is how um, Julia Annas, uh, this, this um, woman philosopher, uh, describes uh, Plato's uh, idea of the soul, this tripart soul. There are two main reasons why it is appropriate for reason to rule the soul. One is that it is the only part that cares for the interests of the whole soul and not just itself. Whereas the other two parts care only for themselves and not for the whole of which they are parts. Reason then is the source of practical judgment about what is best for the person as a whole. The other ground for reason's rule over the whole soul is that a life which is shaped by devotion to the aim of reason i.e. searching for the truth, is a better life for the person to lead than a life shaped by devotion to the ends of the other parts. Right, so the intellect, right? If you devote yourself to, to these philosophical pursuits, the, the pursuit of intellectual wisdom, right, the, the other parts are going to be handled. Right? Because that intellectual cares for, you know, for you to be fed, right? needs you to be fed. Right? It also cares for your honor and your self-esteem. Right? But the other parts, right, only cares for themselves, right? You're fed, you're fed, and that's it, right? If you have honor or you're winning, you're winning, right? At least that's what Plato thinks it works. So that's why you're going to hey, devote yourself to the intellect pursuits in order to have the other parts uh, in control. Right? Somebody who's avaricious or vicious or greedy is, gonna, is letting the other parts rule over the intellect. So someone who just cares about sex, right, is letting the first part, the appetitive part, the appetite part, take over the intellect and the competitive part. Or someone who cares just about winning all the time, about just always looking good, right, is letting that second part take over uh, the other two parts. And the only one that's going to keep a nice balance between all three is the intellect one. Because the intellect cares about all parts of the soul, not just one part, not just itself. So Plato uh, here gives another allegory to explain his idea of the soul here. So here's this individual, and then he kind of like stretches it, he generalizes it to a whole state. Right? So in order to have a harmonious state, you're going to have this harmony between the intellect, right? the competitiveness, and then the lowly appetitive part. Think about a state, right, a, a nation. He says, the, if you want to have a harmonious nation state, you've got to follow the same procedure, the same formula here, of the tripart of three parts with the intellect leading the role. Right? So in Plato's Republic here, he gives us this idea as well. Right? So, <clears throat> So in order to have a good nation state, a good government, says Plato, it's not a democracy, first of all, right? Democracy killed his teacher, Socrates. So he hates democracies. So what he thinks is the best way to control the nation, to govern the state, is by um, what we call the mer merit meritocracy. Meritocracy, based on merit, not on the demos, right? So democracy. So classy is a state, uh, type of government, right? How are you going to govern? And then demos means people. So democracy 
is a government of the people, of the demos. Uh, meritocracy is a government based on merit, right? On how good you are, how worthy you are, right? You merit it to be a leader or not. Right? And he breaks it up, the state, in three parts as well, Plato. Right? So in order to have a good, harmonious state, nation, you're going to have three parts, right? And it's the same thing as a so. You have the appetitive part, you have the competitive part, and then you have the reason. But it's transposed in actual people and their duties to the state. So the appetitive part are the, uh, the producers, the, farm, the farmers, the artisans, that people that produce food, right? And whatever's pleasurable for us. That's the first part. The second part, the competitive part, is uh, what it calls the auxiliaries, which is like the police, the military, right? It keeps us safe, right? Protection, right? the warriors. And then the reason is what he calls the philosopher kings. So for him, intellectual people, i.e. philosophers, should be the leaders of the state because they're going to harmonize, they're going to take care of the other parts of the state. Right? Same like your soul. If you, lead, if you let your intellect uh, take the role, take the lead, the other parts of your soul, your competitiveness and your appetitive part of your soul, are going to be in balance. It's the same with the government and the society. If you let philosophers become kings because they're intellectual, because they're smart and wise, they're going to control and harmonize the other parts of the soul. That's going to, and thus, you're going to have a peaceful, harmonious society under philosopher kings. So don't vote for Biden, don't vote for Trump, vote for me. I'm a philosopher. Just kidding. Don't, don't. I hate politics. But that's the way uh, um, the republic, right? This is what they call it the republic, right? Pretty much like this is what he's leading towards, the perfect republic, right? Or some argue like, wow, it's not possible because of all the characters he stumbles upon in this book here, right? So you guys gonna kind of got this, right? So, so based for Plato, right, the best way to rule the government is uh, meritocracy based upon this idea of the tripartite soul, transposed into society's roles. Right, you have right, you have reason, which is the guardians or the philosopher kings. You have spirit or the auxiliaries, which are the leaders, the warriors, the police. And you have the appetite, which is the producers, the laborers, the carpenters, the artisans, the farmers, right? Reason should guide the rest. So we believe in meritocracy. So there's types of types of governments, right? We have a dictatorship, right? It's only a tyrant, right? Or a dictator. There's a democracy, which is ruled by the demos, the people. Uh, there's a meritocracy, which is ruled by merit. Uh, and then there is aristocracy, right? Which is a government of the aristocrats, right? The the privileged class, right? And according to Plato, the best one is merit meritocracy, based on merit. And the merit based on your reason. Who is the most reasonable person? Right. Keep in mind, though, right? This implies, though, that not everybody's equal. Right. He clearly states, right? Plato is unequivocal that reason is the most important part of the soul. And thus, when you translate it to a society, thus there's a hierarchy, right? The producers, right? The farmers, the artisans, the carpenters, those people are on the bottom of the of the society's pyramid. And then above them are gonna be the warriors and the police and the military. And on the very top is gonna to be the philosophers. Right? So not everybody's equal, right? Uh, he was fine with slaves, right? He was fine with slavery, right? This is Plato, right? It was for him was a normal thing, everyday life, right? So he didn't have qualms of God, right? So a meritocracy is not about equality. It's about what's most reasonable, what's the best, right? And that implies these hierarchies. It implies inequalities. Not everyone is equal. Not everyone is going to be a philosopher king. We need people to work at McDonald's, for example, right? But we need to, uh, you know, farm workers to keep us fed, right? The lettuce in my McDonald's, right, or whatever. So. 
people are unequal and because there's they they share different kind of privileges and powers okay but it's placed but it's i mean granted man it, it's based on merit right it's not like uh like in hinduism where they have like the case system where you're born into a certain case and you're stuck there here you could become a philosopher king if you go to the academy and study philosophy for example or you could become a warrior if you could become trained as a warrior right so there is social mobility, but there is inequality in Plato's Republic, right? But according to him, it's the most rational way to find a most peaceful and harmonious society, right? You might agree with them, you might disagree with them, right? but it opens up this whole can of worms that a lot of uh, political philosophers are gonna have to deal with for the, for the next 2,000, 3,000 years, right? We're still talking about Plato in 2020. All right, uh, that's pretty much it. That's all I have for Plato. Um, I could go on and on, right? We have a whole semester on this guy alone. But this is basically his basic tenets, his basic philosophy, and I really hope you enjoy this because he's gonna haunt us for the rest of the semester now, Plato, right? Like uh, Alfred uh, Whitehead said, uh, the best, the most, the safest characterization of the European tradition of philosophy it's just a bunch of footnotes to Plato. And if you don't know what a footnote is, <clears throat> a footnote is, I don't think I have, a, let me see if I have a book. A footnote is when you read, no, this one doesn't have footnotes, it has any notes. Fucking books. <clears throat> this one has footnotes. Yeah. So a footnote is when you read a book and there's like a little number, then you go down here and it gives you like a larger explanation of what's going on. Right. So what this guy is saying is that philosophy, right, in the Western tradition, the European tradition, all it is, is that Plato is the main dude, and all we're doing is just adding footnotes to what Plato is saying. So adding, you know, clarifying or adding to what Plato is doing. Right. Basically saying that Plato is the foundation, and everything else that's from there, that's what we call philosophy. Right. So that's how that's how important this book is, and not just this book, his other dialogues as well, though. But this is the most well known. Like if you take political science, you read this book, right? Uh, if you read literature, you might, well, you might read this book as well. It's just a tremendous book here. Can't overemphasize how important this book is. Get it and read it. All right, guys. Uh, chapter is chapter five. Aristotle. Aristotle is Plato's best student, right? So you have this genealogy of intellectual um, progression from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle, and they're each, each other's students, right? Student, teacher, student, teacher, right? And they kind of outdo each other, or they try to outdo each other, which is fantastic. And you'll see how Aristotle completely goes against this theory of the forms, right? And Aristotle is known as like the father of science, right? Empirical data. All right, so we'll talk about Aristotle now. Keep up with the discussion boards. And thank you. Right, stay safe and wash your hands. Wear a mask.